Welcome to Thinking Green. My guests tonight are Mike Alowitz and Emma Willer, and they've both been on before, and I'm going to hand it right over to them to start with. Well, we did, Emma and I discussed some things today in preparation for the show, and we did want to say something at the beginning about Aaron Bushnell, who was the 25-year-old airman who immolated himself in front of the uh, Israeli embassy in Washington on Sunday. And um, he was an amazing person. I don't know what his background was. But if you uh, read the statement and watched what he did, he was so articulate. He was fearless. He was calm. And he set himself afire, took his own life uh, in opposition to the genocide in Gaza. And uh, we felt we needed to say something since it's what we're going we're gonna to be talking about, uh, the occupation tonight. Um, and uh, he really is a martyr, and he, his name should be honored. Um, he, even as he lay burning up in agony, kept yelling, Free Palestine. And I think a number of people online have noted that what happened in those few minutes really exemplified the best and the worst of what goes on in this country. Because while he was making this incredibly heroic sacrifice, the Israeli guard and the cops, at least one of them had their gun on them instead of trying to save him, instead of uh, getting a uh, fire extinguisher on him, they had the gun on him, revealing just the whole nature of the rotten, militarized police force uh, in this country. And of course, the Israeli cops are totally enmeshed with that. Uh, but uh, I think uh, over time, uh, we're really going to come to uh, have to carry on some things in honor uh, Aaron, uh, it's an amazing thing he did. Uh, uh, we should all be very proud of him for doing that. Well, thanks for bringing that up because the U.S. press really is not covering it, if at all, not really communicating what the motive was at all. Fortunately, it's all online. Yeah. And a lot of people have seen it. Um, but yeah, of course, the whole media coverage of the events in Gaza is a nightmare from the corporate media in the United States. I mean, it's just insane. Uh, it is so right-wing, so jingoistic, so hysterical, and uh, so backward. Um, it really, I, it's, for me, I think watching these events is so revealing about the nature of the decline of capitalism, even more so than things like Vietnam and stuff. It's just an entire horrific charade of lies. And uh, yeah, but fortunately now, we have the internet. You can find the stuff. You need to go look for it, but you can get information. Um, and it's important that we do that. I think half of our effort uh, I, that when I talk to people who are like reasonable people usually, uh, but are, are only read the U.S. media and are so incredibly 
uninformed and misinformed that uh, it's just unbelievable. Even Haaretz in Israel, which covers, um, gives out a lot of information. It, it has the right-wing stories in it, but it has the left-wing stories stories in it, and it doesn't really shy away from depicting reality, uh, you know, and, and of course there are human rights groups in Israel that are documenting things, uh, you know, from a very close vantage point, and it, it isn't getting to the U.S. Well, it's even getting even less to a lot of the Israelis, actually, uh. but, you know, as you know, because um, you live there, but... Uh, as we were talking before, and, and you know, the lie has gone on since I was a little kid. The stuff I was told, you know, that this was a, you know, the whole establishment of Israel. This was a, a people with no land to go to a land with no people. Yeah, except it was full of people. <laughs> it was full of people, but you know, I mean, I didn't grow up in a Jewish neighborhood, but. You had to give the, your pennies to plant trees in Israel, and there was all this crap about the dirty Arabs and the, you know, the glorious Jews who were chosen, who were bringing, uh, uh, who were making the desert blossom. They always used to say, and even among very progressive people, this stuff. So this enormous lie has been going on all these decades, and uh, it has an effect. Well, you know, and I was born after World War II, but not very long after World War II. So the Holocaust was kind of not very far in the rearview mirror. I was born less than five years after, you know, the camps were cleared in the end of the war. And I can kind of get why that sentiment was there among traumatized people. Oh, there must be some safe place for us. But even people who felt like that at that point, and I can kind of get it, it's a failed experiment at best. I mean, there were forces from the start that were very colonialist forces, uh, and, and you go back and that piece of land has very rarely throughout the last you know, three millennia uh, had sovereignty because the superpowers of every, every era want a piece of that strategic land. Uh, well, what's, yeah. what's amazing uh, about this and what's so revealing about what capitalism and Zionism has done is that Jews had an incredible history of struggle and were victimized from the pogroms, from, from Nazism, from all that, and yet mostly were socialists and radicals of one sort. Yeah. My, my, uh, Grandparents were all communists and anarchists, and this was very common. And had this, and they were all proletarian. They were all poor workers, and um, so even what happened in the Holocaust, the Jewish Holocaust, because of course there's other Holocausts that are never mentioned. Um, but in the, in the Holocaust against the Jews, they could never, never dehumanize the Jews, but the Zionists have managed to dehumanize a big section of the Jewish population in Israel. They yeah. really have dehumanized them so that they do not feel empathy for other human beings. Yeah, and, and I think we're, we're really going to see that, however this turns out, um, I, I feel as though the IDF soldiers who are doing their regular three years are very indoctrinated, really indoctrinated. But I feel as though the reservists who are in their 30s and 40s, who have wives and kids, who, who spend a month or two in Gaza, I think a lot of them are going to come back broken. And we have not seen the, the end by any means of people who are physically damaged, traumatic brain injured, uh, PTSD, uh, and the amount of substance abuse and addiction, domestic violence, depression, suicide, I think is something that is, the Israelis just are not really well prepared for. Well, and there has in the past been a history. There was a, a anti-war movement within the Israeli army at one point. Yeah. 
you know. So um, they've really done a job on people. But, you know, ultimately, Israel is over. This whole thing has, you know, Ham Hamas is not a progressive group, but this whole thing, this resistance and the re international response has laid the basis for a genuine discussion uh, of apartheid in Israel, which has never happened before. Right. And it's the beginning of the end because what, what's, what are they going to do? They have no plan. Their only plan is to uh, kill Palestinians and grab the land and the resources. And that doesn't solve the problems for working people in Israel. No, in fact, uh, I looked at, I get a daily thing of uh, how RS headlines. I do too, yes. And yeah, I think it was yesterday or the day before, three of the articles basically said the, the plan for the day after is there is no plan. Yeah. Um, so anyway, I want to yeah, get, get back a little to <laughs> Red Square. And Emma, uh, I found on the internet that you had made a, a movie recently, a 10 minute. Uh, uh, YouTube YouTube video. video, which I found, mm -hmm. and uh, so what is Red Square doing about this? I know that a couple weeks ago I was there and the old Breaking Walls video was also being shown, but, uh, you know, I don't know, <laughs> what are your thoughts about, <laughs> about getting involved in, in this from the art point of view. Well, you want to take that? No, we can't. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, we're just using the lessons from history and our, mostly his experience from going to Palestine and trying to share that with the world and um, yeah, try to teach people about the impact we can have and that was 20 years ago, and but right. a lot of it is, you know, Seemed really... very timely, didn't it? <laughs> yes, although I think there are not holes in the wall anymore that people can, you know, look mm. through. I think it's a pretty solid wall. Well, of course, it's, it's so much more, I mean, it's so much worse, of course, obviously, at this point. But what was, I think, revealing and what I, my whole experience there... And I think what makes the film a little, you know, uh, is, is that it reveals the humanity of the Palestinians. They are the most generous, loving people. I, you know, I, I think part of it is just life in, the, in that part of the world because I found the same thing when I worked in, in Iraq, too. And, um, you know, it's just... Um, there's that one scene in the movie where uh, Salam, who is, they have been sending him from crossing to crossing, you know, and they just make life miserable because they're trying to drive people out. And, and what is his response to this? He says, oh, may God have mercy on these poor people. He's talking about yeah. these punk Israeli kids with guns who are these arrogant, half of them are probably from the U.S. Um, and... Yet he feels bad for their lack of humanity, um, and it, it it was very revealing uh, about the nature of the people there. You should explain how the project was initiated. Oh yeah, in fact we have a little slide, but yeah, how how did the project get started back in two two thousand three? Well, it, we organized it uh, the way a lot of my projects have been organized. Uh, basically, is we build it from the ground up. So we did it at that point. We had a group called the Labor Art and Mural Project, which was basically, um, you know, we got a group of academics and labor people and stuff like that, uh, actually similar to the sponsors of Red Square now. And um, we begin by getting some local unions to endorse, make a small contribution, and we gradually build it. And we build a broad coalition to sponsor it, um, Chris Gavro, who was uh, one of the anti-war leaders in the state and who's um, a leader of the social movement, uh, socialist movement in Connecticut, uh, organized a labor contingent that came along with us 
And so we met with Palestinian unions, we met with Jewish unions to the extent we could, um, and we had a broad framework to carry on the project. Um, and we've done this um, in places like Northern Ireland during the Troubles, and when I went there, in, and in Iraq between the wars and stuff, and it's, it's in the Ukraine. We have to do that have a broad coalition to sponsor it because that's what protects the artists who are involved because people take these images very seriously and people have guns and um, there's all different forces at play. Um, you know, there's a Stalinist Communist Party, there's the Israelis themselves who would be happy to shoot you if they felt they could get away with it. You know, there's national, you know, there's all these people and in order to, um, effectively carry on this stuff, you have to have a broad coalition. And, and we want to do that anyway because the importance of these projects, um, in the film, it, that film it talks about how important it was to the workers there, and it's a very moving thing. But really the importance is what we did with it when we came back because we gave talks, we did slideshows, we're on programs like this where we talk about things. Because ultimately, we have to build an international movement that's going to force an end to the occupation. And a big part of that is what happens in the U.S. Because if the U.S. was forced to withdraw its support from Israel, it puts Israel in a very tenuous situation. Because Israel can't survive without massive support from the U.S. Not just the funding, but the political support, the weapons, the, the, all the stuff that goes into keeping it propped up. There's an old clip of Biden saying, if we didn't have Israel, we'd have to invent it. And, you know, it, it's very true because Israel is the bastion against the Arab Revolution. And you see that very clearly. It goes to Lebanon and bombs Hezbollah. You know, it, it's, it acted against it, sent troopers to the Belgian Congo when there were people uh, uh, in revolt there. You know, and it, that's what it's for. It's a big military base, surrounded by kibbutzim <laughs> that act, that create little socialist socialist enclaves um, that provide this image, right? Right. Well, even you know, one thing we were very aware of when we lived on the kibbutz was internally it was socialist, and there were some good experiences there, like learning about how like work can be organized in a way that isn't hierarchical as you see so often in the US. But I mean, there were, was, were no illusions. It was a capitalist entity in terms of dealing with the outside world. Well, the whole thing is theater, essentially. It's a nightmarish theater. But you know, whenever you listen to these, these jokers um, defending the, the genocide, you know, it's like, well, we're the only democracy in the middle. You know, all yeah. this crap, it's just, it's just made up. And, um, you know, well, we, we, don't, we don't do genocide. We were the victims of genocide. And we're very careful about who we kill. Meanwhile, there's, you know, tens of thousands of children being buried under the rubble. And it's, it's bizarre, um, but... If you say it long enough, decades long, then there are a lot of people who, who can believe it. But hey, it's falling apart now. People are seeing it. Amidst all this uh, horror that's going on, the bright light is the massive demonstrations, the millions of people. This has never happened yeah, before. Yeah, worldwide. Yes, right. International, a global movement of outrage by the working class and just not accepting any of this crap that they're anti-Semitic because, of course, these demonstrators are, are not at all. They're the ones who are fighting anti-Semitism by building working class solidarity. And it's, it's all collapsing. Israel is done in a long-term thing. There will, there's not going to be two states in there. There's either going to be capitalism, in which case the world is doomed, or we're going to make international revolutions. We're going to do what we did in South Africa, which is to overthrow apartheid. Uh, and, and that I see is really 
the only reasonable path forward. When we were there, uh, one thing uh, that was quite different from when we saw both the you know, 2003 film and uh, pictures from w what it is now, everything was wide open. They actually hadn't built any. There was the occupied territories and there was Israel, but there weren't any walls between them or checkpoints between them. Like the road maybe was paved better on the Israeli side than the Palestinian side, but you kind of got a glimpse at that time of what like a single state could become. Well, it's and, there should be a democratic secular Palestine. And that's yeah. where Jews can live as they did before the establishment of Israel. And you know, that is the only solution ultimately. Well, it really it has not become a safe haven that I think maybe idealistic, naive people thought 75 years ago, because I'm sure the Jews in Israel are not staying awake in the middle of the night worrying about me and you in the US, like making it through the day. But I wake up in the middle of the night thinking about these reservists coming back to their families totally messed up. And, you know, the mental health workers you know, leaving for the UK because the Netanyahu government can't even fund mental health services. Um, so I can't think of a more dangerous place in the world right now for Jews to live than Israel. So but it's not because of anti-Semitism. No, no, it it's, isn't. It's just bec it's because they're a colon colonizing Absolute. power and doing Absolutely. horrific things to human beings. And yes, all the things yeah. that happened to my generation in Vietnam is going to happen to these. The, yeah. You know, it, for me, it's always been very interesting because I was a victim of anti-Semitism when I was a child, you know, and it was real. And my, these people, these young Jews that I meet, they've never suffered from anti-Semitism. They've never been beaten up because they were Jewish, yeah. you know. They, and... Uh, this reliance on this victimhood, um, it's, it's, it's unreal. It's, it's, the, it's the Palestinians who are the ones who are the victims of the anti-Semitism. And actually, a lot of the Christian Zionists, I think, are very anti-Semitic. I, I, I could do a whole show on <laughs> my wariness of Christian Zionism because, you know, the, some of them, they want the second coming. They don't care if everyone who's already there dies. So, uh, but let's, um, so I know you've been on the show talking about your labor murals uh, all around the world. So we have some slides of some uh, of the three murals you did during this uh, trip to Palestine. How long were you there, by the way? I don't know, a month or two months, I don't know. Okay. It wasn't a lot of time. <laughs> um, these, these things are painted very quickly. So, so we have a slide starting out with the Rachel Corey project. And... Um, well, that, that is uh, the Rachel Corey Peace Center in, in Anada. And that has been an international project. Um, it was the home of this Palestinian family. It's been knocked down five times. And international groups come in and rebuild it. I'm not sure what the status of it is now. I don't know if it's been rebuilt uh, since the last time it was knocked down. But it, that mural is no longer there. Like most of my work, it's been destroyed. Um, but that, uh, Rachel Corey was a student from Evergreen College out in, in uh, Washington. And um, she was uh, a solidarity activist who was um, uh, helping expose the, ha the home demolitions that were going on. Because um, Palestinians, you know, you go to work or school in the morning, you don't know if your house is going to be there at night when you get back because they can come in and say, in 10 minutes, you got to be out of here, and they knock the house down. And, and it's done through a whole series of legal red tape kinds of things. Oh, you don't have a permit for this, you don't have a permit. The same way they harass people going to work and whatever. Um, and uh, so 
Uh, by the way, that building way off in the distance behind there is a torture center because torture is legal um, in Israel, and that's where Palestinian children are tortured. Um, but these are details uh, from the mural that we're looking at, and it's, um, uh, it's a crowd carrying signs that say, no walls between workers. And in, in the murals that I painted there, the three murals, I painted holes in the wall to signify um, the fact that you can't stop solidarity by building walls between people. I mean, it's, it's really what the walls are designed to do is to intimidate and terrorize people. And there is no threat to Israel that a wall is going to stop. And there is no threat to people in the United States that you need walls in Mexico. Walls are, are uh, designed to intimidate and divide human beings from each other. And, uh, of course, as mural painters and artists, we paint holes in the wall. We paint walls to unite people. And uh, so all three of the things had holes in the walls there. And you're looking through there. That was a caterpillar um, because that's the equipment that's used to knock the houses down. It's built in the U.S. And uh, I... So I put a dead caterpillar. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, Jeff Halper, who you know because yeah. he was probably at that time working in East Jerusalem preventing house demolitions. He was he was there in the night, yeah. And uh, a, a, and uh, he did a presentation at Voluntown Peace Trust and one I think at Mystic Community Center, which I went to it, maybe in two thousand four or five, and. You know, we had been involved in the whole Fort Trumbull demolition, and he was showing slides of the East Jerusalem demolitions, and it's like, oh my gosh, it looks the same. It's the same equipment. It, it, it just kind of looked the same. Uh, one thing, when I was reading um, some of what Rachel Corey had written, and it's very apropos to New London, is how... In Washington, the murals are whales. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking, <laughs> in London, the murals are whales. And I, I, I thought that was interesting. We, we do have some murals in New London that are more topical and less benign, but well, it, it is interesting that well, whale her murals. Comments, her comments about the whales, you know, I was very flattered because she was comparing it. I had painted a mural uh, uh, in, oh, right. in Centralia, and she had gone down there and, and, was, and had seen it and stuff. And uh, she said, well, this is what a mural should be, you know, and not just whales. Um, and, uh, yeah, she was very smart. She was very articulate, the stuff that she wrote. And... Um, that, you know, of course, she was killed by the, by the bulldozer driving over her and, and killing her. Um, but, uh, yes, in New London now we have uh, uh, $300,000 going to the whale mural. It's uh, quite remarkable. <laughs> okay. I don't know if we have any more slides of the uh, Rachel Corey one. Oh, that and there's, uh, that's Rachel Corey. I, I painted her and Nuha, who was a Palestinian woman who was also killed. Uh, they're the two figures in mm -hmm. the sky. Um, and, you know, th this stuff is painted. It is very utilitarian. It's painted very quickly. And... Um, you know, a lot of times under adverse conditions. We were, we were in constant threat of them showing up to knock the building down and whatever. Oh, yeah, that's before you started. Yeah. <laughs> and, yes. And that building way off, that, that was the torture center wow. that I was mentioning. Um, and, you know, on, on the left side uh, of that, you can see figures wandering around in the desert. You know, that was, that was they're trying to figure out the peace plan. You know, there, there's always these plans, right? You know? <laughs> you know, and it's all designed, just like the two-state the, the two idea. It's just designed to prevent a genuine change, you know, um, how could you possibly have two states when one of them is waging a genocidal war against the people who would be in the other one? And they've already taken most of the land and created these little Bantu stands for people. Oh, the, the, the map of the wall. Um, there was a, a, an event last 
Friday night, I think, at Hearing Youth Voices, they're getting a group together t to talk about Palestine. And mm. they had pictures on the wall uh, from a previous session. And one of them, I real, did a real double take. I forget what the whole thing, what the quote was about it, but it said it was on the Palestinian side of the wall in Bethlehem. And I'm thinking, Bethlehem is nowhere near the old green line. And then I looked at a map, and there are like walls all, I, all over. And I knew about all the highway system that was displacing residents. But it, it's, it was just incredible how many little walled-in areas there were. It's insane. It's, t it's completely And it's not insane. a very big area. I, I know someone I know was talking about, oh, we need uh, the U.S. or some world powers to have a demilitarized zone between Gaza and Israel. And I'm th thinking Gaza City is 45 miles from Tel Aviv, uh, which there are rockets that can go more than 45 miles. And there are three decently large cities, uh, Rishon Litzion, Ashdod, and Ashkelon, between them that among those cities has over half a million people living there. It's like there isn't space for a no man's zone uh, in no man's land between them. It just, it, it really isn't practical. And I don't know. It's all designed to expel people. Life becomes so difficult. It's, it's an expulsion without an expulsion is, is how people, now we're seeing an expulsion that's an expulsion. Right. They, they look, now we're seeing ethnic cleansing. And, you know, they're going to go into Rafa. A million and a third people there. And what are, you know, they're just going to, what are they going to do? They're going to kill a lot of people. Uh, they're going to try to drive them into the desert or into the sea. And, uh, which is, you know, quite ironic because that's what uh, the Jews always said, the Zionists, not the Jews, always said, oh, that the, the Palestinians want to drive us into the sea. And it's the Zionists that are driving Palestinians into the well, sea. Well, you know, I have a little screenshot from, I don't know, the Likud Charter of, I don't know, maybe 1980, something like that, or late 70s, that basically does say it's going to be, we want it to be Jews only from, you know, over the Jordan River to the Mediterranean. So every time, I, I mean, I hate to say, I don't post, start, initiate posts on Facebook, but I do answer them. And if people start out with, oh, you know, Hamas wants to, you know, they say from the, from the river to the sea, I take my little screenshot out and say, you know, Likud said this a little bit differently, but... And, and worse. all of the corporate press in this country uh, uses this thing. They say, Palestine will be free from the river to the sea. They say that's anti-Semitic. And, and the universities are using it to go after student activists and stuff. And how can saying you want a free land be anti-Semitic? And, but this is, they're so used to the big lie and being able to get yeah. away with it, you know. Um, and, 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 and I think there are a lot of naive people who do believe it. So the next mural, uh, and I think I only have one slide of, uh, of the, um, the bread and, and roses one. Um, bread, roses, and, and, and Bala. Bala. Yeah, Bala. I think I have the whole name on it. Um, and where was that one uh, painted? We can talk about it while they find the slide for it. That was in the Beit Jabrin refugee camp. And um, it, it, and uh, that's it's about 25 feet by 25 feet or something. And uh, it's, Handala is a cartoon figure. Uh, it's, he's, Handala is a Palestinian child and you never see his front. Uh, mm -hmm. he only, you only see his back. He's never gonna reveal himself until Palestine's free. And it's a wonderful little character. I forget the name of the cartoonist who did it, but um, so we put uh, Handala in there. Handala is looking down the railroad tracks, which um, I put into uh, all three of the murals because um, aside from having been a railroad worker, uh, there was Didn't actually- you were a railroad worker? Uh, yes. He laid the tracks here in town. 
I laid the tracks through New London. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> this was a long time ago. <laughs> I was, yeah, I was a track laborer when the high-speed concrete ties were put in. Oh. It's just a coincidence that I'm back here. It had nothing to do with, <laughs> with my earlier life swinging a sledgehammer. Um, but uh, anyway, so Handel is looking down the tracks. But it's a reference also to the events in Haifa, where um, in 48 there was unity between the Arab and Jewish workers, uh, railroad workers. And it's just one little example of it was an important little example where Arab and Jewish workers were working together to advance themselves. And you don't see much of that because the apartheid system kept, keeps things so separate. Um, but it, it's a reference. So it's a starting point. You can learn about that, you know, by looking at the history of Haifa. Above that is Bread and Roses, which is a symbol of the labor movement, uh, which comes from women textile strikers in Lawrence, Massachusetts, who carried a banner in, in the uh, strikes of 1913 that said, we want bread and roses too. We want uh, economic well, well-being, we want a decent wage and working conditions, but we also want beauty in our lives. And, and really, it's, it's, it's the vision that, that we socialists have of what life should be like for working people. Life should be more than working to make capitalists rich. Um, so uh, there's, there's the bread and roses, there's a book in the back um, with Che Guevara on it who symbolizes uh, internationalism, including taking up arms against apartheid in South Africa. Um, what else is in there? Oh, on one side there's an olive grove and on the other side is an apple grove. I, done some work with apple pickers recently in, in um, Washington State where Rachel Corey was from. So I put in these different things. They're really just starting points for people to be able to, um, in, it, it's a pedagogical thing. So, you know, what does this mean? Well, you have to kind of learn about it and, and in so doing you learn history. And that's what, like what Emma was saying, that's what we try to do with Red Square. There's all these images of stuff. Well, what does it mean? And it's part of relearning our history. Um, Dare I uh, ask what happened to the mural since? Uh, in in the refu in Beijing, yeah. I don't know. I don't know. Most of my stuff's destroyed. Um, it could be okay. there. I I have not heard because I haven't heard from people. Um, it's you know uh, I don't I'm not in contact with them. Um, but. Whether it's there or not, um, of course, uh, the refugee camp itself was in terrible conditions. You know, it was, it was out. It was at, while I was painting there that you know I, I, I learned that there were children who thought a tank was a Jew. They, you know, it, it, I, I like to explain this to people who who will hear you know uh, anti-Jewish stuff. Because the Zionists have presented um, themselves as being the Jews. And in this extreme example, the tanks came into the city, and it's the Jews. That children thought the tank itself was a Jew. You know? So when you when you do hear these examples where somebody says something that would seem anti-Semitic. It may not necessarily be that. I mean, it could be, because obviously there's still plenty of anti-Semitism in the world, anti-Jewish uh, stuff in the world. But it's, it's because the Zionists have portrayed themselves as the Jews, then you hate the Jews. I think, I, I do agree that that's kind, kind of coming back to bite groups like Anti-Defamation League by equating even critique of the current government with being anti-Semitic, people who critique the, the, the government now think, oh, I, I guess I hate Jews now, which might not have been a connection that, that was even on the radar screen. Well, Anti-Defamation League, which started out as being 
you know, a defense against anti-Semitism and just became very right wing and in yeah. fact was very involved uh, with uh, government surveillance and uh, victimizing anti-war activists. And uh, we were, as we were talking before this thing, because while you guys were having a party over in the kibbutz in Israel, back here, yeah. um, like in Texas, <laughs> Yeah. We were getting death threats from the Maccabees and the Jewish Defense League. There was a time when really it was a physical danger to be an anti-Zionist uh, Jew. We were called self-haters, you know, and, and all this stuff. That's not true anymore, uh, you know, and, and fortunately. I mean, there's still some uh, right-wing Zionists right. and, and, you know, and just confused kids who will think that. But in fact, um, this is really the first time um, in, my, in my over 50 years of being an anti-Zionist that I have seen like Jewish Voices for Peace yeah. being out there. And, and um, it's just wonderful, wonderful to see this uh, for the first time. Um, there is a lot of oppression on college campuses though. Very bad. A lot of students yeah. are, are um, yeah, being oppressed for speaking out. They're going after them. They're and being attacked yeah. in Rutgers, I believe they were attacked. Um, oh. Yeah. In Columbia. Columbia. And uh, who knows where else, you know. And there's just a lot of informal pressure, too. But it's not really working because the students are standing up and, and fighting back. You know. Well, when we were students, we weren't listening <laughs> to what the, the admins were, 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 were saying. Okay, so there's one more mural that, uh, that you did um, right over the uh, line in, in, into, into Palestine, right? So well, this was uh, with the pa construction yeah, workers. Yeah, the construction workers yeah. one. In, um, in yeah. the walls between workers. And this seems like it's actually a theme of a whole lot of your work, that uh, that workers nationwide, no matter how the leaders are sparring or chummy or whatever, the workers just ha have solidarity naturally and need to build a solidarity. Yeah, it's um, it is, and uh, it's kind of. I, I think something that is my particular contribution with these international murals because same thing in Northern Ireland when I was there, you know, and, and we're painting and at night you have Catholic and Protestant kids throwing rocks at each other and it's like, what are you doing? You need to work together. And we run into problems with even our sponsors because we're for international solidarity, no walls between workers. These Palestinian construction, I was in a construction union. I was a, a laborer on the railroad. I was in the painter's union. I was, uh, you know, a, a sign painter in an industrial union, and I worked in a factory and whatever. There's no difference between construction workers in Palestine and construction workers in the U.S. We have everything in common. Workers have everything in common. It's governments that are the problem, and it's competing capitalist governments. And therein lies the problems. I had no, I've never had a problem anywhere in the world going uh, to paint. In places where people hate the United States government because of what it's been doing to them. And, you know, between artists and workers, uh, there's always, uh, it's not a problem. And there's that group of people in front of the um, thing, uh, the reason that we had that slide was because um, that's a group of people at the dedication of that mural, and, and we were singing the International together, mm. you know, and it was total, and it, it exposes the myth that this is um, all this religious fundamentalism and everything. In fact, you know, it, these places have been very secular. It's when the U.S. gets involved that it becomes, that it builds the Zionist group. And of course, you saw that very clearly with the way that Israel built Hamas in opposition to secular, progressive Palestinian groups. Yeah, that's another little clipping I have, Natanet, who talking about why he's funding Hamas. Yep. Uh, but yeah, I, I get that. 
I hear all the time, oh, you know, they just can't get along there. We, they need international pressure because they, no, they actually need everyone to, to, to stay out. Uh, because I also have never, either here or there, felt any animosity on a personal level. And in fact, when I worked for Head Start, and a lot of, I didn't have Palestinian families particularly, but I had families from the Persian Gulf area and, and Muslim families from Pakistan or Bangladesh. And I'll tell you, when they found out I was Jewish, it was like I was their long lost cousin. You know, they talk about dietary restrictions and I get halal, you know. <laughs> it's almost like kashrut, you know. Yeah. Um, so I, I feel as though on a personal level, there's really a sense of kinship and it's just either, I don't know if it's more lazy thinking or intentional gaslighting that the, the, the main problem is those folks there just can't get along. Well, that's part of the racist ideology of Zionism. And you hear that a lot from young Jews in, in Israel. You can't get along with those people. You know, I, I tell people this story. When I was painting um, on that, cons on that uh, mural with the construction workers, when I'm painting in these places, I'm out there from sunup till sundown. I have a limited amount of time. I don't have time to take meal breaks, nothing. I'm just out there at the wall. So people don't get it, you know, because most human beings on this planet uh, take lunch breaks <laughs> and get together with their family and enjoy some relaxing time, whether you call it a siesta or whatever. But most human beings on the planet, unless you live in an insane uh, society like the United States where you eat while you're driving somewhere and it's out of bag of poison that you got through a window. Um, so I'm out there and I, I said I can't I can't join him and they brought blankets and you know they spread out the blankets <laughs> and sat and had the dinner with with me working but just so I wouldn't feel like I wasn't part of things. And I've had this experience in a lot of places. Um, you know, and human beings are social beings. That's why we're human. It's because we, we work collectively together. Um, capitalism is an insane system and an insane ideology that tries to divide people to get people to compete. And yet, on an organic, daily basis, people refuse to do it. You know, people, whatever confused politics they have, in general, if they have an opportunity to help each other, they will do it. It's like the, the worker in the documentary. You were explaining how they're just trying to beat him down, beat him down. He has to drive for oh, yeah. three, two hours to yeah, his to job. Yeah, some place that should be 15, 20 minutes right. away. And yet his... His his spirit just still just like shines through. There's just he's being so kind to everybody. Yeah. <laughs> well, we have five minutes left, so I don't want to miss uh, talking about some upcoming events that are going on. And uh, I do have a slide about uh, and and I have a better picture <laughs> one. <laughs> I don't know which one you want to use. Um, do you want to talk about this uh, labor solidarity uh, event? Sure. So there's a Connecticut-Palestine Solidarity Coalition, and um, I'm not necessarily representing them, but I, I have been involved a bit. And they're putting on a Labor Stands with Palestine event on Friday. Um, so they have some speakers from the UUP and UAW, um, and it's all about how Unions can join the fight against genocide. Um, and it's going to be at the Berlin uh, Mosque. Um, and that's the place where we've been having, you know, meetings and whatnot. And yeah, so that's this Friday. Yeah, I think I was just contacted by these people. Hmm. Uh, that's a very important development because it's not. I mean, the unions have been run, the conservative bureaucrats that run our unions have basically prevented workers from being able to express international solidarity. 
you know, even in so-called progressive unions, they, you know, the officials will say, well, that's not our issue. We, you know, we stick to what we're fighting for the members and all this kind of stuff. And this is something for the first time. This is a very important development where local unions and, and now international unions are saying, we have to speak out about this because this is genocide of other working people. Very, very. Yeah. In fact, I've heard the whole thing framed as really a billionaire's war against the workers. Mm -hmm. uh, and you mentioned Jewish Voice for Peace. Uh, they have a virtual workshop coming up on uh, February 28th. That's tomorrow. Um, so one other thing that uh, is happening. Uh, yeah, we can maybe zoom on it. <laughs> so. Also, um, if people are interested, um, we have, <coughs> Emma has been putting together videos and a website. And if you go to redsq.org, redsquare.org, redsq.org, um, you can connect with different information, different videos and stuff like that. And we're in New London and, you know, you can arrange to come visit. Yeah, whatever, the too. big red cubicle building. <laughs> and, and Emma's been kind of the archivist and videographer for, <laughs> for putting this stuff together. And I did find, you know, a video that's about 10 minutes long, I think on your website, mm -hmm. but the Breaking Walls video, if you do a search on Breaking Walls Alowitz, yep. it's the first hit. And that's more like 40 minutes, but it's it, it's a really interesting profile of uh, the construction of that last mural that we, sh we showed. Right. And uh, in, as we only have about one more minute left, I also want to kind of say uh, Thursday night, um, for all you voters out there, um, the Free and Equal um, organization um, is having their uh, online streamable debates with uh, the, the, the candidates, five candidates who uh, will not be allowed to be in the major debate. <laughs> and they, they're, they're, they're so across this political spectrum that both Pacifica and Epic Times are streaming them. So Which we, are the five parties? Uh, Socialist, uh, Claudia uh, De La Cruz, oh. Jill Stein, um, oh gosh, um, the other one. Never whose mind, name? No yeah, who's one of the Green <laughs> Party? Uh, Jasmine Sherman. Oh, Jasmine Sherman, and two right wing guys. Uh, a li libertarian and maybe a constitutional party. But, you know, the questions are likely to be uh, more interesting than Trump versus Biden. Well, that will be more entertaining. I it mean, will be more is, entertaining. It, it, you have two old, doddering <laughs> idiots. And, you know, really, the whole age thing would be fine. In some societies, you honor the elderly. They, it could be that, old, that people of that age would have experience and knowledge right. and wisdom. But that's not what we're talking about here. No. We're talking about the dregs of society, uh, the Trumps and the Bidens, which represent the worst of what is possible. Yeah. It, it seems to be the choice between uh, civil war and world war. So, but anyway, it's time to end the, end the show on that cheery note. Is there anything going on in really quickly at Red Square in the next week or so? Just hopefully new videos and updates on our website. So, so go to the website, yep. redsq.org. Yep. Yeah, and, and people can get involved. You know, we're a very modest little um, initiative, and, you know, we're trying to you know, reveal some of the history of our class. That's what a lot of this is about. We have a very militant, uh, the working class of this country has done wonderful, wonderful things in the past. I was, you know, and it, when you see what, for example, Aaron Bushnell did, it brings up the whole thing of how, you know, workers in this country ended the war in Vietnam because it was the army that refused to fight. In Vietnam. We have a great militant history that we have to relearn and we have to re-knit 
an international movement. If we don't create a socialist world, then we're doomed. Well, thanks, Mike. Thanks, Emma. We'll see you next week. Uh, Alt-CT, I'm not sure who's coming from Alt-CT, but Alt-CT will be our guest next week. So thank you for coming on. Thanks for thanks. having us, as always. <laughs>